Many climate deniers still seem to think global warming was invented by Al Gore in 2006. As this recently uncovered recording from 1956 shows, the outlines of climate change science have been clear for many decades. Were the winters really colder when grandfather was a boy than they are now? Does industrial activity have any influence on climate? What makes wool shrink when it gets wet? Can there be any falling stars? These are among the questions we'll be answering as we present transcribed Excursions in Science. Your science reporter, Howard Tupper, has been discussing climate with Dr. Gilbert N. Plass, Assistant Professor of Physics at the Johns Hopkins University. Tup, is the climate in this country really changing? Yes, and not only in this country, Bill. Dr. Plass told me that there are many lines of evidence which show that the climate has slowly been warming up during the 20th century over almost the entire Earth's surface. What is this evidence? Well, some of it comes from the temperature readings that have been taken at stations around the world during the last century. With only a few exceptions, they show that the average temperature started upward around 1890 and has continued rising since then. So science agrees with Grandpa when he says the winters were more severe when he was a boy. Yes, and the glaciers will corroborate Grandpa, too. Dr. Plass says that, with only a few exceptions, all known glaciers from Alaska to New Zealand have decreased in size during the last half century. In 1953, popular mechanics noted that Dr. Gilbert Plass's research had made the case for carbon dioxide as a major cause of atmospheric warming. Dr. Plass was one of many researchers recruited by the U.S. military to study the behavior of heat radiation in the atmosphere in developing a new generation of infrared heat-seeking missiles. The trend toward a warmer climate over the entire Earth's surface is about 2 degrees Fahrenheit per century. This may seem like a very small temperature variation, but we must remember, Bill, that such a small change in the average temperature can cause a very large change in the climate. How so, Tom? Well, the meteorologists estimate that if the average temperature for the whole Earth should drop by only 4 degrees, glaciers would again advance from the poles and perhaps cover most of Canada and the northern United States. Fifty million years ago, the planet was at a high point of global temperature and atmospheric CO2 after a long period of active volcanism. As continental plates gradually changed the face of the planet, the African plate began a collision with Europe, pushing up the Alps, a process that continues today. Meanwhile, to the east, the Indian plate began to press up against southern Asia, beginning a major era of mountain building with the rise of the Himalayan plateau. Volcanic activity was suppressed while huge expanses of bare rock reacted with the atmosphere in a process called carbonate weathering, gradually pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. Natural processes like this can change CO2 content by about 100 parts per million over a million years. The current rate of change is about 10,000 times faster. Between 30 and 40 million years ago, CO2 levels were low enough to allow an ice cap to form at the South Pole. Much later, in the last few million years, ice sheets formed in the North as well. Our current era is actually an unusual time in Earth's history. It's called an ice age, an era when ice sheets cover large areas of the planet. It began around three million years ago, when the continents of North and South America collided. The result, a warm ocean current that flowed around the equator was cut off. So now, the warm water traveled north. Today, we know this current as the Gulf Stream. 
Strange as it may appear, it seems this warm current is what tipped the planet into an ice age. Its warm waters brought more moisture to the cold northern regions of the planet. So more snow fell, and ice began to build up. Slowly, the northern hemisphere iced over, triggering a global cooling. In the last million years, the ice has advanced and retreated 10 times in a cycle, aided by small changes in the Earth's orbit. The course and causes of glacial periods have come into better focus over recent decades. In the last 30 years, sophisticated satellite and computer technology have made possible much better understanding of atmospheric and climate dynamics. But the basic science of the greenhouse effect is over 150 years old, and in 1956, the main drivers of climate change were already well understood. Carbon dioxide is transparent to the direct solar rays, but absorbs a fairly large proportion of the returning long wavelength heat radiation from the Earth. Does that mean that if the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere were increased, the carbon dioxide would prevent a larger proportion of the long wavelength radiation from escaping to space? Exactly, Bill. The greenhouse would have been made more effective and the surface temperature of the Earth would have had to rise. How much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere now, Tub? Only three hundredths of one percent is carbon dioxide, Bill, but it is so effective in controlling the outgoing heat radiation that it has this large influence. Other atmospheric components, such as water vapor, do not materially interfere with the effect of the carbon dioxide because of their entirely different distribution with height. Is there any way that scientists can pin down this carbon dioxide theory? Yes, they have investigated the different factors that contribute to the carbon dioxide balance in our atmosphere. Plants use up about a million, million tons of carbon dioxide per year in photosynthesis. This must be balanced by the carbon dioxide released by respiration of plants and animals and by the decay of all types of organic material. Is carbon dioxide used up or given out by non-living things too? Yes, there are also important contributions to the carbon dioxide balance from the inorganic world. The weathering of rocks, for example, changes them from silicates to carbonates and withdraws 100 million tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere each year. Do man's puny efforts make any significant change in the carbon dioxide balance? Very significant. The burning of coal, oil and wood in industrial processes and other human activity is releasing 6,000 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year. Dr. Plass says that after balancing out the contribution from the organic world, this man-made contribution is larger than any of the natural contributions. If all this extra carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere and no other conditions change, man is actually causing the average temperature to rise two degrees per century. And man will probably add more and more as the years go on, I suppose. Yes, Dr. Plass believes that any reasonable projection of our industrial activity indicates that it will continue to increase for many years. Direct measurement of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere tends to show that the carbon dioxide content has gone up 10% during the last half century. This is exactly the amount that has been added to the atmosphere by industrial activity during this period. The average temperature rise observed for the last 60 years also agrees nicely with the temperature rise calculated from the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It seems clear that the variation of carbon dioxide is one of the important factors that must be considered in theories of climatic change. Thank you, Tom, for this account of your talk with Dr. Plass of the Johns Hopkins University. Any listener desiring more information about the effect of industrial activity on our climate needs only write to Excursions in Science in care of this station asking for a copy of Science Paper Number 646. That's Science Paper Number 646.